this is, uh, I guess, a presentation of um, some of the field work that I did essentially for my um, PhD um, and looking at exploring the relationship between human rights and climate change uh, through the lens of this particular area in India uh, called the Sundarbans. Um, in a sense, I wanted to show you how this relationship or what's happening in the Sundarbans is um, is a product of both uh, history and things that are happening today. Um, so the idea is not to get into a very sort of legal or policy discussion, more to explore the relationships and complexities between human rights and climate change in terms of uh, what exactly is happening on the ground. Um, so if we start with human rights, uh, we obviously live in an age of human rights. We hear about it all the time. Um, and India is no different. India has recognized a number of human rights um, through its constitution or read them in through um, the Supreme Court or other, uh, or other courts. Um, and including in this are uh, some of the rights that I explore a little bit more in this presentation, the right to water, the right to livelihoods, the right to food, um, and the right to a healthy environment. But of course, with uh, lots of human rights, the issue is usually in um, implementation, and so we'll be looking at that as well. Um, on top of this, on top of us living in sort of this age of human rights, m more and more people are talking about what is the relationship between human rights and climate change? Can we still think about human rights in the same way? How are human rights impa impacted by climate change? And you see this at so, you know, at the top levels of sort of governmental um, organizations, so at the top there you have um, sort of political declarations from the Human Rights Council who passed, res uh, UN Human Rights Council who passed resolutions saying human rights and climate change are interlinked. Uh, you also have sort of uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, and that's also again acknowledging that human rights are impacted by climate change. Uh, you have prominent uh, sort of people like Mary Robinson, who was the former president of Ireland, saying climate change is the greatest threat to human rights. And you also have uh, human rights being used by NGOs and civil society activists to drum up support for um, climate change action. So these are the kind of ways that we see human rights and climate change being interlinked. Um, and even more so in terms of uh, sort of the legal sphere, um, you see human rights and the environment or human rights and climate change being linked in a number of different um, areas. So you have uh, international sort of litigation. Um, right now there's, uh, it's said that there's sort of an explosion of litigation around the world on um, human and on climate change generally, but also on human rights and climate change. And uh, so I've bracketed there a case in Pakistan where this um, court has said, actually, uh, we find that the Pakistan government, by not taking action on their climate policies, are breaching rights. So in this way, they're kind of trying to link human rights and climate change. Um, and then we also have what's called sort of the greening of human rights. So how uh, do existing human rights need to incorporate climate change? And then you have procedural environmental rights, which are how do we use environmental right, uh, rights that we have around access to information, on participation, to get better um, results for taking action on climate change? How do we sort of make it more transparent, etc.? So you have all these sort of ways that um, human rights and climate change are being interlinked in sort of the recent, recent past. But at the same time, there's a considerable amount of, I guess, doubt. And this stems from um, the fact that it's only in sort of the last 10 to 15 years that people have been sort of linking human rights and climate change. Hence, you have uh, this quote where Stephen Humphreys, who's at LSE, is writing uh, in 2010. And he says that there's a mutual disinterest between human rights people and climate change people, or human rights and climate change. Um, and still you have people saying, you know, this area is under theorized, it's still vague. Yeah, you, you can say that, uh, you know, rights are affected by climate change, but what else is there? I mean, uh, you know, we need to be a bit more specific on how we sort of have, uh, you know, implement these human rights in a, in a more sort of climate change way. Um, and then you have uh, the last quote I've put there is Anna Greer, who's at uh, Cardiff University, and she talks about profound challenges um, 
that are faced by human rights and environmental law. And what does she mean by this? She basically says that um, there are some assumptions built into human rights and environmental law that if they're not challenged, then the human rights and climate change sort of um, discourse will remain unsuccessful. So yes, you may get nice declarations like the ones I showed you um, by courts or by, uh, by political declarations, but you need to really look at the root assumptions in law and challenge those um, if you really want to implement human rights and climate change. And what are those assumptions that she is talking about? Well, one of them is um, the laws and policies that we are today, who is, who, who, who is placed at the center of these laws and policies? So who is the subject and who is the object? Um, and she says, well, humans are placed at the center, and the environment is kind of seen as outside. So we, uh, you know, environment is just seen as something outside of everything that's going on in the social world. And then on top of that, she's also, you know, she's coming at it from a critical, um, critical perspective, a critical feminist perspective. She's looking at what are some of the other um, hierarchies that are built into the laws today in terms of power relations, etc. Which kind of humans are f given more privilege? Which kind of humans are given less privilege? So, is when we say humans are at the centre, is it uh, the landless labourer, or is it, um, you know? Uh, the government or a business, etc. So uh, she's asking us to look a little bit more at the assumptions that are built into the laws in terms of interrogating how human rights and climate change are interlinked. And she says, if you don't do this, then you, uh, we will continue to fail to respond to the ecological crisis that we have at hand. Um, and so my presentation today kind of picks up on this in terms of looking at uh, relations between humans and relations between human and, and the environment and looking at it in the lens of what's happening or what has happened in the Shundarbuns. Uh, and so speaking of this kind of dichotomy that I'm trying to say about humans and the environment, we see it in terms of how we speak about climate change or how we have spoken about climate change. So for many, many years, you know, NGOs, etc., we're talking about polar bears and ice uh, Al Gore got up on, you can't really see it, on a forklift kind of thing, uh, trying to show us how this graph on climate change is. But what we often miss out on, and sorry, and the last one is about, is the tiger, which we'll come to in the Shundar ones in terms of let's protect the environment, in terms of protecting the tiger or protecting the forest. Um, but we often forget that um, the everyday disasters of climate change are very much rooted not in some sort of external battle against um, carbon emissions, but rather in a lot of these power relations that are occurring on a daily basis at both the local, regional, and sort of global scale. So uh, having said all that, let's now, uh, let me now introduce you to the Shundarbans. So it is an area, as you can see there, on uh, in the east of India. It crosses over into Bangladesh, so it is uh, in Bengal as a whole. Um, and it's uh, essentially a delta region, so um, rivers from the Himalayas come down and uh, feed into the Bay of Bengal, and that is sort of the delta that you see. And it's, def it's a region where it's an intricate sort of network of mud flats, islands created from these sediment loads that have come down. And essentially, it's, a u it's, it's quite a unique area in terms of how land and water are sort of fluid and kind of doing this, almost this dance together. Um, so here you see some pictures and a quote there from uh, Amitabh Ghosh, who's written a lot about this in terms of f fiction um, and in terms of how the whole area is kind of interlaced uh, in a very kind of fluid way in terms of water uh, and land. So Shundarbans essentially it means a uh, beautiful forest in terms of a literal translation in Bengali um, and that's really important because that's kind of the picture that most people have of the Shundarbans when you speak to them outside of the people who live there in terms of people in cities. Uh, they think of it as a forest with tigers, snakes, plants, etc. It's a biodiversity hotspot, and, um, and so conservation is seen as vital in terms of protecting these forests. And people are often forgotten about. There are four and a half million people who live in this area, and they're often 
forgotten about because the focus has been on um, protecting the forest as such. Um, and in terms of the forest, it is a, it's a man, it is the world's largest mangrove forest in the Shindarbons. Now, what are mangroves and why are they important? Well, mangroves, as you can see, they have these breathing roots. Um, they're sort of these unique trees. Uh, and when the floods come in, they kind of almost disappear and then come back. Um, but they kind of hold together the islands that are there. So they're a really important um, part of the natural flood defense or climate defense, you could call it, um, for, the, for the region. But they're also, importantly, in a really big, what's called a carbon sink. So they, um, they soak up the carbons and thus reduce sort of our carbon emissions. Um, but as I said, in, in many ways, what's forgotten about uh, in the sort of ideas we have about the Shindler ones is the people. So, and that's, uh, so I wanted to show you three um, short pictures and clips uh, to sort of explain this sort of relationship that I'm exploring about um, human rights and climate change. The first one I'll show you is a few seconds of a clip from a documentary um, that a friend who's a filmmaker did uh, in a sort of village that I also visited for my own field work, so hopefully this works. Pays the maximum price. It's women in these villages who pay the maximum price of the changes that happen after an embankment is reached. One of the victims of the breached embankment was Ahida. I watched in amazement as she trudged through the water to fetch a pitcher of fresh water. the last part well she just says it's it's very far um, so for in this scenario, what you see is the relationship between climate change and human rights um, through a, a, a number of different things coming together. It's not just uh, climate change has come and impacted her rights, but rather um, there are a number of processes. So firstly, um, it's women who face the brunt of the duties around water. Water is not just for drinking, but it's for a number of uses, sanitation, health, food, etc. Um, and what we see is her daily commute through the sea is because the embankment was breached, and we'll talk about embankments in a second. Um, the, other, the other point here is that so she's going to a tube well, which is located far away, um, and while the government has placed a number of tube wells, they don't, re they don't really tell us the story of um, how those tube wells are used. Are they, they're used often for multiple things, how those tube wells are in terms of um, how uh, sort of regular they are with water. So uh, for, my, for many times, many parts of the year, there's no water in those tube wells for a large part of the day. Um, and they don't tell you how long someone has to sort of line up to get water um, because there's so many people dependent on one, or two, uh, on, you know, one source of um, drinking water. So for someone poor like Ahida, she has to do this daily. However, if you have a bit more money, then you may be able to get your own tube well or something like that. If you live, uh, if you live further inland, or you can maybe get your own pond. Uh, and we see here, so a number of processes coming together, her gender, her poverty, her social status, her, the geography of her location being located near an embankment, etc. So this will be a continuing thing, theme of like the number of things that come together in this relationship. Moving on then, this is what um, I was talking about in terms of embankments. Um, 
So the entire region being very flat and very low uh, is basically held together by these embankments um, that are built. They're built essentially uh, using bamboo and mud, um, so they're quite sort of um, simple in that sense. Um, and in the rainy season, it's a daily sort of uh, daily sort of occurrence where they have to um, the people communities have to rebuild, continue rebuilding these embankments just to keep uh, their land from having the floods or the the sea come in. Um, Several things can be talked about when we just look at this one um, picture. So what usually happens when the floods come in um, or the seawater comes in is, as you can see, all of this gets inundated. And that means that uh, you cannot grow crops there for a number of years. Um, what happens then is that people become reliant on um, other forms of labor. Their livelihood, livelihood changes. They might uh, then seek employment as daily wage laborers, or they might go into uh, fishing, which you see um, someone over there tra uh, trying to catch prawns. Um, and embankments themselves are an issue because the idea itself is uh, to basically straitjacket the, protect the river or this, uh, the sea from coming in. Um, but they don't account for the fact that, uh, for example, these, this water which comes in from the sediment loaded rivers is actually meant to um, unload that sediment onto the ground. That's the sort of natural sort of way it's meant to meant to occur. But in the sense that what's happened is that you built the embankment to protect yourself from that sediment and from that sea coming in. And what that does is make uh, increase the sea level as well, which you're trying to protect yourself from. And if and when this embankment breaches, the ferocity of the floods is much worse because so much more water is caught in between um, these embankments. So there's a basic sort of hydrology question around there, but there's no other option. Now you have these embankments and you have people living there, there's no other option but to keep doing it this way. A bigger question arises, which again I'll pick up on afterwards, is who maintains and looks after these embankments? Um, and, and that is a sort of another uh, sort of element of a power relation where human rights and climate change is impacted by the sort of um, the governance system that is set up for these embankments. So, and the final example or picture, sorry, that's the same sort of that's this uh, fisherman trying to um, fish while these embankments are being breached. So the final example I wanted to show you was um, of livelihoods in the area, um, specifically shrimp seed collection or prawn seed collection of prawn seed farming, um, which is a type of aquaculture that is particularly done by, as you can see down below, um, at the ground level by uh, women primarily. Um, and you, this kind of work is done, maybe she'd be working 10, 12 hours and earning about 150 to 300 rupees for the day, which is about two to three pounds. Um, it's quite a painful sort of task, but primarily what I'm trying to emphasize here is, is the impact of climate change kind of um, changing livelihoods, because if someone was previously farming and the embankment's been breached and they cannot farm anymore, they're often dependent on uh, sort of prawn se uh, shrimp seed farming. There's another link here to climate change, which is that this practice of prawn seed farming is um, is seen as quite unsustainable, and why is it, why is that the case? Because the uh, the nets that are used are um, dragging along the ground, weakening the embankment, weakening the embankments that are used to protect the island, and also while you're doing this activity, what you do is essentially you pick up all the uh, fish you can and then you just take out the prawn seeds and everything else is chucked out. So what that does is uh, completely change the fish diversity in the area and then that impacts the mangroves uh, quite quite badly and that is of course the flood defense that I was talking about before. So it's this kind of vicious cycle of um, how climate change is impacting in not in kind of a linear way but it's a kind of cycle that it, that occurs. Um, also, interestingly, it's if you see these uh, up the top is where the 
once it's um, the seeds are done, then they're fished and they're farmed in these kind of ponds. And you have an interesting practice of people who own these ponds breaking the actual embankments to allow seawater in to fill up these ponds. Again, it's this cycle that you see of climate change and human rights impacting. It's not a kind of linear relationship. So this goes back to, I guess, in a way, um, what we were talking about at the start, which is this profoundly complex relationship between environmental law, climate change, and society or human rights, and how interconnected they are in many ways. So what are the climate change kind of impacts in, uh, in Shundarbans in terms of projected climate change impacts? Well, the first thing to note is the area, even though it's sort of seen as a climate change um, hotspot or whatever, um, a lot of the stats are under-researched or a lot of the studies are un is under, in general in South Asia, climate change modeling, climate change uh, statistics can be under-researched. There's not been enough sort of longitudinal research done. But the things that we see are sea level rise well above uh, global averages, cyclones increasing, monsoons getting drier, uh, sorry, monsoons getting longer but also uh, less predictable. And that is uh, one of the key sort of impacts in a sense because it impacts agriculture. It impacts people's ability to grow food because, um, because they cannot predict the rainfall. And, uh, and, that of, and then, of course, there is land loss, which I showed you in terms of the amount and number of islands which have gone under, etc. Um, and finally, the mangrove link, which I've talked about already. In a way, though, the, uh, the idea is not so much to focus on statistics um, and because it's incredibly difficult to disaggregate what this, these sort of things with what's happening on the ground. Um, and the more we talk about some of these statistics, um, the harder it is in a way because, climate, uh, because there's a lot of uncertainties with science. That's not to say climate change is uncertain, but at a, at a sort of local level, there's so many uncertainties and that confuses policymakers almost and it becomes an excuse to basically dilly-dally and procrastinate in terms of taking action. They use it as an excuse to take, uh, not take action when actually if the focus is more on what's happening on the ground, then uh, it becomes more of a reason to start making some changes. In terms of development in the Shundarbans, it, it remains one of the most underdeveloped regions. Um, it, it, there's a number of statistics up there. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the health statistic that I've put. The ratio to, of doctors to patients is uh, truly shocking. And add to this, if you add to this, a transport sort of issue. Um, because of the way the geography of the island, it's very difficult to get from one island to another island to see a doctor. It can sometimes, uh, even a short distance can take a long time because the boats don't operate at all times. Um, so you have many stories, every family or every household will have stories of uh, people basically dying on the way to see a doctor. And this of course again, if you think about some of the impacts of things like flooding, having increasing waterborne diseases, uh, increasing pollution, as well as um, making it tougher for uh, sort of having enough resources in terms of providing for health care, etc. There's this, again, a vicious cycle between development and climate change. So as I said, it's very difficult here now to d disaggregate some of these, uh, this underdevelopment from what's happening with climate change. But the emphasis I want to make also is that this didn't just happen because of some uh, accident of geography as such. It was definitely produced and um, the environment, the human environment, the natural environment was a production of politics and law which operated for a number of years. And so in that sense, if we go back to history to sort of understand why, why these things happen. Um, so just very briefly about the history of this area. The, the long history um, just shows how the way society, governments have co-produced the environment in this way. This has very much been based on this assumption that the environment is outside of us um, and has, has basically put particular uh, institutions like the state um, or the landowner and given a lot of power with some of the laws that, um, and some of the policies that have been produced. Um, 
So in pre-colonial time, yeah, there were some settlements from Portuguese or from, and then it was sometimes uh, there's tales of piracy in the area, and then there was um, small land ownerships and settlement. But the sort of um, key element in the Shundarban's uh, recent history has been the colonial um, history. So in terms of the colonial history, the re uh, so since about 1770, the British became really interested in this area. They said, well, actually, uh, let's reclaim this area. Let's turn it into farmland. We want to gain taxes from this area. So they brought in a number of laws to basically legitimize that. They delegitimized whoever else was there, which is what, what has been done all around the world. Um, and they basically tried to extract revenue from, this, uh, from the area. Of course, it wasn't very successful after a while. People were faced with um, cyclones and, sed and this sort of environment of sedimentation, uh, siltation, etc. Agri agriculture revenue was not very high, but still people were there living, um, living in, uh, in the forest, etc. And then in terms of the Shundarbans history, a key sort of uh, Time came in the 1870s um, when there was a s sort of survey by the British. The British loved to do surveys, and they did one off Bengal by this guy, W.W. Uh, w. Hunter, and he spent a long time talking about the Sun Shunarbans. Um, and for him, maybe it was his uh, Victorian sensibilities, but he was basically, for some reason, saw this area as some you know magical place of not magical in a good sense but a magical place of jungles and beasts and um, things so there's a quote by him but even though he spent like about a hundred pages discussing it in this book he he basically just meant has a passing mention of the people that lived there along the same sort of lists which have tigers and snakes and other things uh, he also just listed that oh yeah there are also some people why is that important? Because this sort of imagination of the Shundarban remains today in terms of the laws and policies and governance of the Shundarbans. The people are just seen as, um, as an aside. Around the same time, you also had uh, some changes in terms of how the British managed forestry. Um, so you had the British basically introduce forestry acts, which were uh, not really conservation based, it was based around um, their interest in maintaining a sustainable supply of forestry for um, their you know, imperial forestry purposes. Uh, and that really impacted the Shunarvans because you had a particular part of the forest essentially being said to be protected and a particular part reserved, which meant that people who lived in the forest, all their rights were basically taken away. Um, and essentially, these last two quotes that I've put up there summarize the history of the Shundarban, which wasn't just, as I said, an accident of geography, but it was very much a sort of political, legal kind of production which engineered this, um, the environment that you have even today. Um, and so even in the post-colonial era, the focus has been on this production, uh, protection of forests from both the national and the global scale. So even so, you see how UNESCO, WWF, others have been very much interested in the protection of the forest, forgetting very much about um, the people who are there, the, the human rights of the people who live there. Uh, and I've highlighted the something called the Morachapi massacre, which happened in 1977. It's uh, it should be more than just a bullet point because basically hundreds of refugees who were living on an island were killed by the state because the place was deemed as forest land and there were encroachers, etc. But it's a bit of a flashpoint in terms of when you think about, um, again, relationships between humans and the environment and what has been sort of how our assumptions of the environment have been preserved, uh, have sort of produced these results. So moving on then a little bit to how the Shundarman area is administered so that we can then get into um, how it's governed and how human rights and climate change come in to effect today. Uh, essentially, you have the state level bureaucracy having a big role in the day-to-day -day lives of people. So irrigation department, health department, etc. Again, it's a legacy of kind of these laws which place a lot of emphasis on the state. Um, 
you have something called the Sundarbans Development Board, which was set up in, I think, the early 90s. Before that, there was another one set up in the 70s. Uh, and you have these multiple departments which overlap. For example, the Sundarbans Development Board, if you ask them about uh, embankments, they'll say it's not our responsibility. If you ask them about drinking water, they'll say it's not. So it's kind of, they use the, the fact that there's many people to essentially shift blame and you don't have an overall picture, an overall set of principles which govern the area. So how did these, uh, how did these admit, how did these play out in terms of uh, different aspects of the relationship today? So three aspects I'll um, cover. One, embankments, which I've talked a little bit about before. Secondly, water, again, I've talked a little bit about before. And finally, in terms of disaster relief, rehabilitation and relocation. So firstly, embankments. Um, obviously, I showed you the picture in terms of how it, it, it is visually. So these, Im the embankments are, basic, are basically governed by embankment laws which date back to colonial times, the 1880s, um, and they were last updated in the 1960s. So if you think about new assumptions of climate change and you know environmental knowledge that we have today, they are w well out of date. Um, they place a lot of emphasis on the role of the irrigation department, who are seen as the sort of experts um, on embankments because it's an engineering-led kind of uh, engineering-led department. But there's a question there in terms of who is the expert because communities are living there, and but it's very much uh, top-down expert knowledge-led governance system. The community's role is essentially limited in, in a sense because its, its input can be limited to, to the irrigation department, for example, hiring someone to be a middleman between the department and the people working on the ground on building these embankments. Um, and communities are limited in terms of just providing labor to build these embankments. There's very little oversight in terms of the irrigation department itself, in terms of you know, widespread no, um, sort of knowledge around uh, corruption that occurs in the irrigation department in terms of you know, there'll be an embankment breach, which means a bunch of money comes to the irrigation department, they give it to contractors, and each of them take a cut. So there's a saying sort of everybody loves a good drought, which a journalist um, wrote a book about in the same sense, everybody loves a good flood. The governments, in this sense, love a good flood because it means relief money comes in, which they can then uh, use in this way. Um, there's also issues of land acquisition from embankment building. Going back to what I showed you, if an embankment is breached because of rising sea levels, because of floods and storms, a new one is built, more land is taken, people's houses, livelihoods again are affected, again they're moved to marginalized um, Sec uh, sections of society. Embankments are also seen as part of the climate change adaptation framework, which means that essentially um, what the government has said is part of our adaptation for the Sundarbans is to simply keep doing the same thing as we do, give more money to the irrigation department to build embankments in this kind of way. So what scope is there for human rights in this well, one thing that we could start thinking of is how do we change these relationship relations which have produced these um, these material outcomes of climate change in terms of governance. So, in terms of uh, you know widening the base of participation of gov uh, in embankment governance um, away from just having ownership of the embankments at the state to making them more of an embankment commons or something like that. So, these are the kind of ideas that need to start. Um, being thinking of when we s start thinking of human rights and climate change. Uh, so water, uh, obviously we saw that very, uh, that small clip about access to water issues. Um, the right to water, which is recognized in Indian law, uh, is primarily concerned with drinking water. Um, and that is primarily how the NGOs and the government departments also conceive it. So it's definitely uh, focused on providing a tube well at a particular location and saying, okay, 250 people live here, we've provided one tube well, and that's that, that's 
our duty is kind of done as long as we check the water every now and then in terms of quality. However, what we see on the ground as um, sort of the videos, etc., showed you was that um, there's a range of things that are missed out because of just doing it in this kind of metric way and kind of seeing human rights in this kind of just turning it into metrics. Um, it becomes blind to the daily power struggles over water, but also the multiple uses of water. P people are not just using this water for drinking, uh, but they need it for sanitation, for health, for livelihoods, etc. Is there a place for us to expand our understanding of this human right to water to, to um, look at the multiple uses that people have on the ground of water? Just providing a tube well um, for every 250 people may not be enough. Uh, finally, a little bit about disaster relief, rehabilitation, relocation. Um, the disaster management framework did change about 15 years ago, or about 10 years ago, I guess, um, and after the tsunami, uh, to try and look at things in a more sort of holistic way. Uh, and West Bengal implemented its own disaster management policy, but this was seen as inadequate in terms of some of the things that have happened uh, when cyclones have hit. And so human rights in this sense can work towards um, building an idea of disaster which is more than just sort of relief, um, and more than just providing water pouches and food when there, is a, when there is a cyclone in terms of building sort of some of the pre-disaster sort of uh, pre-disaster frameworks. But also more than that, the last point I've made, there is there space for the everyday disaster? And this is important because often um, there'll be an embankment breach or something like that where 10 to 20,000 people are impacted, but it's still not termed a disaster. Um, and sometimes you will see that people will say, uh, if only it, they were lucky they had a cyclone because they got aid relief. We didn't get it because you know it wasn't like that, etc. So in that sense, is there space for um, providing something for the everyday disasters that we see happening on almost a daily basis in the Shundarbans. Um, so Shundarbans, uh, the authority, the development authority has faced, failed to pro provide a sort of adequate rehabilitation process. Interestingly now, the World Bank is working with the West Bengal government on having this rehabilitation and relocation plan. So often you hear in the international media, etc., about people having to move because of climate change, large-scale migration, etc. That's exactly what the World Bank is working with the government on um, in terms and but it's 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 a controversial project because it involves relocating you know an area where there's four and a half million people. How do you relocate that while um, sort of doing it in a way which protects human rights, etc. And especially in India, where you've had rehabilitation, uh, sorry, relocations done in very bad, in a bad way. So, but um, that that's happening at least in terms of policy circles. Um, and the final point that I've made there is, uh, what of climate change, loss and damage? And this is an interesting one because if uh, loss and damage is this thing that you hear is a something that's set up under international law is being set up under international climate change law to provide uh, money for essentially where there has been climate change loss and damage. Um, if this was happening in, it, so the same things that are happening on the Bangladesh side of the border, it's definitely seen as a climate change loss and damage issue because of Bangladesh's um, status as a least developed country, but India's obviously a middle developed or whatever you want to call it. Um, it doesn't engage in the same frame in this um, conversation. Could there be something similar set up in a national framework, in a regional framework? Is there space for something like that for an area like Shundarbans? So final thoughts are the relationship between climate change and human rights, um, we've seen how multiple processes are interacting in driving these rights issues. It's not a simple case of just saying climate change is happening and therefore people's rights are being breached. There are many things happening on the ground which are causing these rights to be breached uh, more, more so than uh, usual. Climate change is and will continue to being a major intervening 
process in this sort of production of water and climate injustice that we see. Um, the human rights issues in the Shundarbans can't really be disaggregated from climate change anymore. Any sort of climate change issues are human rights issues, climate human rights issues are climate change issues. But they're also intertwined with these everyday power relations with the state, with other um, people in the community, etc. And so this sort of bifurcated approach that we've seen when the environment is seen as separate or uh, as separate from us needs to sort of be challenged. And that's kind of what the bigger theoretical point is. Um, and to do that, one of the ways is to broaden the human rights framework to look at some of these many relationships that are intertwined. So when I was talking about the right to water, to look at multiple uses of water, to look at when we're looking at embankments in the relationship with the government or the state, um, and incorporate this in terms of uh, how we think about human rights today. So, thank you. So, any questions otherwise? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about like, how you perceive things to perhaps change in the future. Do you think uh, the regional governors or those who are in charge, is it just so complex that they, it's, that they can't or don't want to do anything about it and it will continue kind of business as usual? Or, yeah, it's kind of Bangladesh, sorry, no, Bangladesh Delta plan. And you yeah. They're quite brag. The whole yeah. country is a Delta, but in, in your mind, where do you see do you see there any momentum building for significant changes in how they treat human rights? Yeah. Yeah, it's obviously... <laughs> no, it's, it's obviously different from what I hear. I've not been to the Bangladesh side, but from whatever I hear, even from in, so international NGOs are, um, who are working there, etc., it's very different space for good and bad reasons. Um, in terms of Overall, for what, what tends to happen in a way is that some big event happens and then there's some changes. So that cyclone Isla, which I showed, um, provided some changes, but it also, it's, it's, it, overall, obviously, it's not a good thing. I'm not saying that at all. It was hugely, completely changed the sort of lives of people there, and it's always brought up in conversation as a sort of tipping point. Um, but sometimes those events maybe see changes happening. Um, apart from that, uh, it really, it's very hard because you don't really have, uh, you have a lot of NGOs operating, but you don't really have as many sort of people's movements who are working towards changes um, outside of sort of just the charity NGO sort of structure. Yeah, uh, the right to housing, adequate standard of living are both included as far as I know. Uh, Rupa might be able to help. But yeah, they have been read in, in the same way as, uh, as the Supreme Court has read in the right to water, the right to food, etc. So it has been recognized under Indian law. There's a bigger question about how it's sort of implemented on a day-to-day -day level, how it, and also, sometimes a lot of these rights have seen them implement, like the courts have read them in, but has there been further le legislative changes which is um, to align it with the human rights? So the Supreme Court might say that there's a human right to water, but how much have the laws around water that operate um, aligned with an understanding of the human right to water? In the same with housing. Uh, yeah, Rupa and then. Perhaps the elephant in the room that got left out is the actions on the ground with the large minority issues and cost of issues, which islands get relief, which islands don't get relief, um, which, which communities get access to the flood houses. Yeah, yeah. 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 You left it out then. No, I did. I mean, it's quite. 
obviously complex. I didn't leave it out because uh, it one yeah. It's how much can you sort of build in one? I mean, I saw this playing out in my own fieldwork. If I can give an example from that, in terms of the areas which had embankments and some of the areas which didn't. And uh, interestingly, I asked someone in the government about this, saying, I visited this area, why did they not have an embankment this happened? And he said, well, that community, we tried 10 years ago, they stole everything, blah, blah, so they're not getting an embankment because of this. So it, it again, goes into showing these sort of multiple processes that are at play. It's not simply a case of climate change and human rights in a linear kind of way. It's so differentiated based on gender, caste, tribal. There's a huge, uh, I didn't go into the history as much as I could have, but there's a huge tribal population there which were brought by the British uh, to clear the forests, essentially. So going back to what the British imagination of the Shundarbans was, it was seen as this wild place. Well, who are the people who are capable of uh, sort of dealing with this wild, crazy place, we'll get the tribals who we think are wild and crazy uh, to come. So they were brought um, from another area in Bengal there, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned that like relocation has been really controversial uh, in this place, and uh, like, yeah, it's really difficult like to relocate like millions of people. But I, will, I was wondering, what do you think if like maybe relocation could be like a an effective measure of yeah. human rights protection. Yeah. Yeah. If it's properly regulated. Yeah. No, I mean, I think to some, like, to some extent, I think relocation needs to be, I mean, they have to plan around it because it is happening on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. People's, yeah. um, people's sort of land is going and they're either going more inland or they're moving somewhere else, um, etc. So to some extent, it needs to be thought of. Um, it's just how they do it has to be very sensitive to so many different issues and how it's been done in the past and has been documented and for other um, things has not been done very well. So though, as I said, the World Bank is thinking about this, WWF is um, into this kind of idea, so they've released, released plans. Um, but there's a lot of mistrust between um, well, between different NGOs working on this. Uh, so if you ask some of the NGO other NGOs, they're saying, well, we don't agree with WWF on this uh, because they, you know, they're you know, they doing this, but at the same time, they're doing rural electrification plans if they don't believe people should be here. They don't trust the WWF also because of its history with conservation, etc. So there's a lot of sensitivities about this, but it, it kind of needs to be thought about because it's happening already. Yeah. Tourist revenue and is that uh, yeah? Human yeah. Uh, sorry, just as a background, is that something that you are researching the Shindamans, or is that something that you just picked up from the? Um, <laughs> I spent these weeks. I spent a lot of time there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, in, in villages and yeah, and read a lot about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly. I mean, eco tourism is now being promoted on a you know large scale by the government and seen as some kind of. Thing that will save the area almost, um, and it's it's not done well. There's man, like you know big problems with where they're building things in terms of uh, breaches of coastal 
uh, zone notifications and um, sort of building on very fragile lands which where they shouldn't be building things. Um, and so again, it goes back to this perception that is uh, this sort of perception that is um, perpetuated about the Shundarbans being this wild, pristine thing. And people, as soon as you tell someone in Calcutta that you're going to the Shundarbans, they just have this magical sparkle in their eyes that you're going to see a tiger or something like that. And they forget that there's four and a half million people there who live in some of the most marginal sections. So again, it's another sort of, I mean, I haven't looked at the tourism side as much, but you see it as another sort of um, angle of this dichotomy between human environment and yeah, the way we think about humans and the environment. So, so. Okay. Okay. Um, very specific thing, the World Bank project, are we relocating people before they have flooded out of their they, own homes or? They have some, uh, so I, <laughs> From what I understand of it, they have three sort of uh, categories of people. And so it's three categories of land. And so some people they want to look at before. Some people it's kind of they want to persuade to like in a more sort of give them options to relocate. And then the other part is the stable embankment, which is sort of they want to increase livelihoods, etc., to keep people well maintain some sort of sustainability there. Um, that's sort of what they've, what they said in terms of relocation to date, yeah. So before, does that make sense? So some people are being told to move? Yeah, uh, I think from what I've read about it, etc., it's also based on this idea, like there's this, like there's, in the Netherlands, when they were building the embankments, they kind of really persuaded people to move in that kind of gentle, not more than gentle persuasion. How it actually gets played out, maybe more than, just more than gentle. Uh, but that's kind of why there's all this sensitivity around it. Um, so where are they talking about relocating them to? From places which are like imminent flooding, Levels into just slightly more inland, but in the same uh, uh, like mangrove area. But it's obviously a lot of the relocation that happened during the Maradi era yeah. was to cities. Yeah. So people who've lived generations and generations in this area, and they weren't helped once they got to cities. They were given, you know, a little bit of cash and left there, and that's a huge component of their human rights. Mm. Because from that point on, there was nothing they could do, and they yeah. work land. They couldn't. They were just thrown into a city and. Yeah, I, I, I. Are they talking about relocating them within the same kind of an environment? From, so from the limited conversation that I had with the person at WWF, it seemed to be more at uh, sort of places like sorry, well, uh, I said WWF because World Bank is working with WWF, um, and I met the WWF people in the Shindlerans. It was to places like Canning and other uh, sort of stable delta. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, away from, but that creates a big issue because uh, Canning is very different or these areas are very different to the areas that they live in. Um, so, you know, it was, yeah, I'm, I don't know how much uh, specificity they have in terms of their plan yet, but it's definitely something that... Is it about relocating them because of imminent, like, flooding to their homes and the potential that they or more about more space for the tigers, the lovely tigers? Uh, no, from what at least was said was it's more to do with climate change threats. Uh, but assuming that what they want to create is a buffer zone in terms of if you want, yeah, so if you see the delta, they want to create a buffer zone where people are not there. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, this is a question about uh, because the single is spread over not just Do you mean? Uh, everywhere. So, um, I mean, it's natural that a lot of them have already crossed the border. Yeah, the border. that happens a lot. Then it becomes a question of the climate. 
migrants. Right. You mean people who've crossed the border from Bangladesh living in the Indian Sundarbans and what happens to them if there's relocation? Um, or do you mean... In the Indian Sundarbans or living in India anywhere, like, the, but they've crossed or, like, or will be crossing anyway? Yeah. No, I don't think there's been any sort of, not that I know of in terms of specifically looking at Bangladeshi um, refugees who've come across. Um, I don't know if anyone else has. Uh, sorry? They're all over here. Yeah, they're all over, including, and. Because they haven't been the fans yet. No, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's historic because there are different waves of people from Bangladesh coming to the Shindurmans. Um And actually, yeah. Yeah, I don't think they've. It has to they've be more yeah, no, I agree completely. It needs to be, or there needs to be, but uh, regional solution. But then it becomes a sort of geopolitical <laughs> issue. Um, so yeah. Does it, re but does it even recognize refugees as such? Yeah, I mean, it's not a. Have they signed? They've not signed the refugee convention, as far as I know. But they use it for certain refugees, Tibetan or certain. But climate refugees, I don't. I don't think they have. Yeah. Honest, yeah. I don't. Yeah, I. I suspect that they haven't or they won't, unfortunately. But yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, you had a question. No, it was like I went to say something about what she was saying. Like, I think it's really controversial to say just climate refugees because mm. there are so people that are internal displaced. Mm. So it has been like, it's, it's really useful, I think, for political reasons. But yeah, yeah, there are a lot of people that are displaced just in the same country. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's an, I mean, if you look at the, the Indian side, the amount of migration out of the Shundarbans because of because essentially because of climate change and other impacts as I've shown here, you can't disaggregate it from other things that are going on. But the fact that you know in every house uh, there'll be some pe family members working in other parts of India sending money home um, is because of these things, right? Um, and yeah, and I guess in Bangladesh they cross over because they're, they're don't have this massive sort of country to go into other parts of, yeah. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.